When we look at the heavens, we seem to be in the center of a vast dome or hemisphere in which the sun, moon, and other heavenly bodies are fixed. This dome appears to us to revolve from the east to west in 24 hours round a point, which in our latitude is nearly halfway between the zenith, which is directly above our heads, and the horizon. This point is called the North Pole of the heavens, and it would appear to an observer at the North Pole of the Earth to be directly above his head. To one at the equator, it appears on the horizon. It is never seen by those below the equator, and it is always as many degrees above the horizon as the place from which it is seen is to the north of the equator. In consequence of the oblique situation of this point in our latitude, every other part of the celestial hemisphere appears to us considerably more elevated at some times than at others, in proportion to its distance from the pole, and some parts daily disappear below the horizon. For instance, if we observe the course of the sun, we shall see that he rises in the east some time between four and eight o'clock in the morning, that he attains his greatest elevation in the sky at 12, and that he sinks below the western horizon between four and eight in the evening. We observe the same also with respect to the moon, but the times of her rising and setting vary much more according to her situation with respect to the earth. the stars, we shall see some of them rising and setting in the same manner, but those which are near the pole never set, and one star may be observed which nearly occupies the place of the pole and scarcely changes its position at all. This is called the pole star. If we watch the stars still further, 
we shall see a few of them which change their places with regard to the others. These are called planets, whilst the others are denominated fixed stars. The appearance termed the Milky Way is occasioned by an immense number of stars situated at too great a distance from us to be seen distinctly without the aid of very powerful telescopes. Dr. Herschel counted 7,200 stars in the field of view of his telescope, which comprehended about one five hundred thousandth of the whole celestial hemisphere. The Milky Way is a nebula, which appears to us large and more distinct on account of our proximity to it. And with the whole of our starry firmament, it will form a cluster, the form of which may be in some degree judged by the arrangement which they exhibit to us. The sun is the center of light, heat, and attraction to the whole system, and round him the planets and comets revolve. His diameter is 882,000 miles, and his bulk is more than 1,300,000 times greater than that of the Earth. When viewed with a telescope, various dark spots are seen on his surface, by the motion of which it is ascertained that he rotates on his axis in 25 days. The spots are by no means constant, their size and form undergoing great changes from day to day. The diameter of some, which have been observed, has been as great as 45,000 miles. There can be little doubt that the solid body of the sun itself is dark, its brightness arising from the luminous atmosphere with which it is surrounded, and that the spots are openings occasionally formed in this atmosphere through which the dark mass below is seen. This represents the telescopic appearance of the moon, which is distant from the Earth 240,000 miles and revolves around it in 27 days, 8 hours, nearly. Her diameter is 2,180 miles. The physical constitution of the moon is better known to us than that of any other heavenly body. By the aid of telescopes, we discern inequalities in its surface, which can be no other than mountains and valleys. The lunar mountains generally exhibit a volcanic character. The highest has an altitude of about one and three quarter miles. Here we see the sun in the center, nearest him Mercury, then Venus, the Earth and Moon, Mars, then Jupiter with his four moons, Saturn with his ring and eight moons, Uranus with six moons, and Neptune with two moons. All these bodies move around the sun in regular orbits, those nearest him revolving most quickly, and those at a distance moving at a much slower rate. Thus, Mercury performs his circuit in 88 days, whilst Neptune occupies 164 years. Has a fiery red appearance. This is supposed to be owing to the density of his atmosphere. His distance from the sun is 142 million miles and he revolves about it in 687 days. His diameter is 4,100 miles and he revolves on his axis in 24 hours. The white appearance at his poles is supposed to be caused by perpetual snow.
that the Earth is a globular body, there are many ways of proving. Though the different irregularities in the Earth's surface appear great to us, they are very small when compared with the size of the globe, not being greater in proportion to the Earth's diameter than grains of sand on a globe of a foot diameter. The Earth, however, independently of this irregularity of surface, is not a perfect sphere, the equatorial diameter being greater than the polar by 34 miles. This is caused by the tendency of the matter composing the globe to fly out at the point most distant from its axis, owing to the velocity of its diurnal revolution. were perpendicular to the elliptic or plane of its orbit, the sun would shine directly upon the equator in all parts of the Earth's revolution round it. And there would consequently be no change of seasons or of the length of the days and nights throughout the year. But this is not the case, for the axis of the Earth is inclined 23 degrees from the perpendicular and is always in the same direction so that, the poles being alternately directed towards the sun, he shines in succession opposite all the parts between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Here is explained the cause of the different phases of the moon, as they are called. The planets and their moons do not shine by their own light, but by a light reflected from the sun. Therefore, when the moon is between the earth and the sun, or at her conjunction, her illuminated side is wholly turned away from the earth, and she is not visible. In about two days she begins to appear, a small part of her enlightened face being seen from the earth. This is what is termed the new moon. As she proceeds in her revolution, more and more of her is seen. And when she has passed through a quarter of her orbit, half of her illuminated side is visible from the earth. When she arrives on the other side of the earth, or at the opposition, it is plain that the whole of her enlightened side is seen. She is then said to be full she then again begins to diminish until she arrives at the conjunction when she is totally obscured. The moon always keeps the same side turned towards the earth and in consequence all parts of her globe are successfully opposite the sun during one revolution round the earth. The moon not only receives direct light from the sun but reflected light from the earth, which will serve as a magnificent moon to the moon. Its apparent size to an, ob an observer on, on the moon being 13 times as great as that of the moon is to us. As the planets and their moons derive their light entirely from the sun, they throw a dark shadow behind them, where they intercept the sun's light from the immense proportional magnitude of the sun. However, the shadow is of a conical form and converges so soon to a point that in no case does the dark shadow of one planet reach the orbit of the next. That of the moon, however, sometimes falls upon the earth and that earth upon the moon. The shadow caused by the Earth is about 840,000 miles in length. When the Moon enters this shadow, she suffers a deprivation of light, more or less of her disk being eclipsed according to the degree in which she enters the shadow. It more often happens that the Moon at the time of conjunction is a few degrees on either side of her node, so that she is above 
or below the plane of the Earth's orbit. In this case, the umbra will fall above or below the Earth, and the eclipse will be partial. Owing to the large size of the Earth's shadow, total eclipses of the Moon are more frequent than those of the Sun. Besides occasioning the striking phenomena of eclipses, the Moon is the chief agent in producing a more ordinary but not less wonderful effect which we observe in the alternate flux and reflux of the ocean. The Moon, having an attraction for the Earth similar to that which the Earth has for the Moon, though much less on account of the difference in size, has a constant tendency to draw up the more movable parts of it to the point nearest itself, so that the depth of water in any part of the Earth, when the Moon is exactly opposite to it, or on its meridian, is much greater than it is at other times. As the Earth turns on its axis once in 24 hours, each part of it would be opposite the Moon once during that time, and there would consequently be a rise of the water in each part of the Earth once in 24 hours. <coughs> but we find that only half that interval elapses, and that there is a tide on the side of the Earth directly opposite to that, on the meridian of which the Moon is. This may be explained in the following manner. It is the law of attraction that the attraction diminishes as the square of the distance of the attracting body increases. The part of the Earth nearest the Moon will therefore be attracted more strongly than the centre of the Earth and the centre more strongly than the opposite extremity. The water, therefore, in that part, will have less attraction towards the centre of the Earth, and being, as it were, left behind, will rise in that part to a height nearly equal to that of the water which is under the Moon. Whilst at the water being drawn away from the parts of the Earth midway between these two points, ebb tide will be produced there. In conclusion, it may be observed that it seems impossible for any person to enter so far into the study of astronomy as to arrive at a knowledge of the various disturbing causes which affect different parts of our system, and the wonderful powers of compensation which everywhere counteract them, without arriving at the conclusion that all this is the work of intelligence and design directing the original constitution of our system and impressing such motions on the parts as are calculated to give stability to the whole. Here we see the Greenwich Hospital for Disabled Sailors, designed by Christopher Wren. Behind the Greenwich Hospital can be found the Royal Observatory. Both are on the prime meridian now we will see a typical day on the Thames at the Prime Meridian. Longitude O degrees, O minutes, O seconds.
to end our show, we will present the optical wonder of the age, the 1844 invention of Mr. Henry Child from the Royal Polytechnic Institution, London, the dazzling chromatrope. 